people choose to live in a perpetual state of self-inquiry. Mm. So good. And if that sounds exhausting, then you're not hearing it properly because it isn't. It's actually the opposite of that. What's exhausting is spending so much time in unnecessary suffering. So it's actually invigorating to always be in inquiries like, how am I feeling right now? Is it good enough? Could it use a little love? You know, how's my state in the, what, here's the language, this is the language. What emotional state am I thinking my way into right now? And do I love it? Is it help? Is it serving me? Could it use a little bump, um, an upgrade? You know, being in that inquiry constantly, constantly. So that's, I mean, that's a perpetual routine. Welcome to the Add Value to Entrepreneurs podcast, the place where we help entrepreneurs to not hate their boss. Our mission is to end entrepreneurial unhappiness. If you dream of changing the world, but you're not sure where to start, the Add Value to Entrepreneurs podcast will help you transform your life and business. This podcast is for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life that they desire. You deserve it, and it is possible. My name is Robert Peterson, former passer turned CEO and the smiling coach. I believe that success without happiness is failing, but there is hope. Join us each week as we bring you an inspiring leader or message to help you. Thanks for investing time with us today. Just wanted to mention this episode was recorded earlier. And as our audience grows, we just wanted to share some of the value from our earlier episodes. Today's guest, Chris Doris, is a mental toughness coach. Ultimately, he's in the business of success coaching. He helps people close the gap between how their lives are and how they want them to be. He started his career as a social worker working on the streets of Atlantic City helping the mentally ill, drug addicted, and homeless populations upgrade their lives. Eventually, he created an internship with the men's golf team in Arizona, which evolved into a paid position as a mental toughness coach. Chris discovered mental toughness tools and has trained the minds of world famous actors, NFL and NHL coaches, business executives, Super Bowl champions, and billionaires. And he says that he lives a work-free life because he truly loves what he does. If you're an entrepreneur who started their business with a purpose and a passion that has been lost in the busyness of the daily grind, we get it. That is why we've opened up our free strategy calls. A lot of entrepreneurs, probably including you, just want a sense of clarity on the barriers holding them back that you need to overcome in order to accelerate your growth and achieve your dreams. These short 30-minute calls give you a chance to work with one of our coaches without any commitment or pressure. Scheduling is easy. Just go to smilingcall.com. Let's jump on a call and get you the help and clarity you need. Select a time and let's build your business. It's time for you to add value. Well, Chris, man, I appreciate you jumping on the show today. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and wisdom with us. Well, I appreciate the invitation, Robert. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So, obviously... I, I think you started in Atlanta, on the streets of Atlanta, as a as a counselor. Well, it actually, it was Atlantic City, New Jersey. Oh, I was close. And uh, well, you got the first, <laughs> you got the first all, all letters right. The whole Atlantic City. So, um, yeah, as a social worker, clinical social worker, right out of college, took uh, a job working with homeless folks and chronic schizophrenics and drug addicts. It was it was a rough deal. Wow, talk about leaning into the mess. No kidding, man. It was a hell of a fa- you know what? In retrospect, perfect foundation for the rest of my vocation. I didn't know, I couldn't have known it then. I just took it because it was available. Sure. And, and well, it served, it was it involved serving humans. Those were my that was those those were the metrics. I a, an available I job, but it's in service to humans. I understand entirely. So I I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and and feel like neither one of those have done anything for me compared to actual ministry and and, and being a part of people's lives and and like I said, leaning into the mess. Yeah, I hear that. Absolutely. Yeah. There was a woman one time I asked me. I told her uh, we were at a dinner function and she was asking me what I do for a living and, and my answer at the time was <laughs> sometimes I get playful with my my response to that question. 
And at that time, I actually said, I am Viagra for the mind. But I was sitting around a bunch of geriatric people and realized that that was probably not the smartest response given the context. So I quickly replaced it with saying, I'm a life coach. Nice. And I help people close the gap between how their life is and how they want it to be. I mm. looked at that. And then she asked this brilliant question. It was just so sweet because she was curious. She was simply curious. And she said, oh, wow, how interesting. What qualifies you to do that? I thought, what a beautiful question. And I said to her, can I tell you what, first, can I start my answer with what doesn't qualify me? And what doesn't qualify me is my bachelor's degree in psychology. I basically said to her exactly what you just said. What doesn't qualify me is my master's degree in counseling psychology. What doesn't qualify me or you know, having or being an author and a speaker and having a podcast and all that, what doesn't qualify me you know, are you know, all the jillions of personal development books that I've read. What doesn't qualify me <clears throat> are all the countless personal development workshops and retreats that I've attended around the globe, having worked with people like Deepak Chopra and gone to South Africa and having worked with shamans. That's, that's all really powerful stuff, <clears throat> but that's not what qualifies me. What qualifies me is my love for people and my passion for serving them. Oh, that's so it. good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's a willingness to lean into the mess because by our nature, I think we avoid the mess. We avoid people's issues. Mm. Like when we ask our coworkers or, or friends, how are you doing? Our expected answer is, I'm good. Thanks for asking. And, and we move on, right? We don't expect them to say, dude, my life is blah and I need help. And I just want somebody to talk to. You, and are you going to stop right now and, and have a conversation with me? <laughs> it's so funny. That reminds me of two things. So one is uh, my former business partner and current soul sister and colleague and, and dear friend, Dr. Allison Arnold, or Doc Alley, as she goes by. When we were, we, we started our business together. And when, when I got into sports psychology out here in Arizona, it was called Head Games. And um, she would walk into the office and my door was open. She would come in, plop down. And the way we greet each other is always, always has been and continues to be, dude, dude. <laughs> So should we just say dude to each other? And then she pops down into the chair. I'm sitting at my desk. She's sitting right straight across. And I go, how you doing? And she would always go. How am I doing? Like I'd asked her, what's the meaning of life? And she would take it so seriously. And, and whatever. And she would just slow down to get really clear with herself on what the truth is to that question. And then whatever it was, she would say, she would go, I'm freaking pissed if that was her truth. Or she would go, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. Or, or if it was true for her, she would say, this, I'm amazing. And whatever the truth was, it was really, I just love watching that. You Absolutely. Know, watching, you know, just watching her slow down. And then the other thing it reminded me of is a former uh, golfer that was on the Arizona State um, men's golf team that I coached for 11 years. He's from Sweden. Jonas Runquist, <laughs> huge guy. And whenever, you know, people would say, how are you? And, you know, they're walking by each other. And he would stop as if that was like, like, hey, can we have a conversation? He would go, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> so if I ever said to Jonas, how you doing, man? I'm ready for him to go. Well, here's what's up. <laughs> I thought it was beautiful. Yeah. Well, I love you demonstrated something in there that, that was really cool. And a lot of people don't understand the power of that. And that Dr. Allie, is that what you call Allie, it? Yeah, Dr. Allison yeah. Arnold. Yeah. So when, when she sat back in the chair and did that, that physiological sigh. Yeah, yeah. Is so powerful. Uh -huh. Just she for, it. Just she for resetting, it. resetting herself and, and really exploring what you're really experiencing inside. And like you said, one of those things you just you just don't learn. Somebody has to teach you the power of that. Just you know, taking taking those couple of deep breaths and just going, oh, how am I? You know, she 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 could be a future guest of yours as well. She um, she's such a fascinating person. She has traveled the planet. You know, she studied. She lived in monasteries in with the monks in Nepal. Ooh. And then she did it again in Thailand. Nice. 
and then you know and then she went to spend two weeks in silence to integrate it all at um at a retreat center in california at jack cornfield retreats wow. fire whatever i can't remember what it's called but she, it, that's that, yeah so streets of atlantic city is a social yeah. worker golf coach mental coach in arizona to to starting starting your own company serving you know anybody that needs their brain rewired <laughs> yeah it was a cool i mean there's a through line so it was social work and then i was a licensed therapist and then i started to practice with doc alley on uh, sports psychology specific working with amateur and professional athletes and then i became mostly professional athletes uh a lot of mostly golfers <clears throat> because I love golf and golf was completely mental game. And uh, a lot of the golfers were business people. And then that opened up a door that I didn't even anticipate into the corporate world, more specifically into the enterprise software sales industry. I didn't even know it was a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> it's just selling huge packages of software to big companies. So I'm helping these people now. 90% of my work is helping uh, salespeople and sales team leaders strength what you said i think you said it before we started recording uh teaching people what we didn't learn in school mm. right like we all had gym class everybody had gym physical education phys ed everybody had that all the way through to have us be crystal clear on the value of being physically active or fit but where was the class that taught us how to have mental fitness. Mm. Where was the class called emotional mastery or the class, how to become a thought warrior mm. or the class on how to uh, practice responding to all of life with enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, and then, and then communication or relationships, <laughs> yeah. right? Like how to, uh, <clears throat> how to actually interact with other human beings is not a class. They just assume you're going to figure it out in middle school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we all know how well that goes right? for most of us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They, the school system teaches us what to think. Mm. It never teaches us how to think. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. Yeah. Wow. And, and it's disappointing. Oh, that's to That's really to, good. I'm stealing that. To th you're, you got it. It's yours. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. The, and then that emotional state, right? state management should be a class like 100 percent yeah 100 percent. because what you know what we learn and we don't learn it in a class but we learn it in life is how to be victim to circumstance how Ooh. to permit the outer world to govern the inner world so the mantra for that is the outer world is a reflection of the inner world so whatever i've got going on in my life is the result the direct result of what i've got going on in my mind if i have chaos in my life it's because i have chaotic thinking if i have abundance in my life it's because i have abundant thinking if i have both it's because i have both which is probably true for most of us Mm, so good yes we uh we, today especially i think we want to be victims of our circumstances we want to be we, we want to be effects instead of causes well there's a story that i tell about how we we all learn to be <clears throat> victims how to permit the outer world to govern the inner world and, and it's very sneaky here's a good story for it <clears throat> pardon me Little girl comes home from school and she's all smiles. And her mom says to her, oh, honey, look at you. You're, wow, you're so happy. I love it. Uh, what, what happened? Did you make a new friend at school today? And the little girl says, mm -mm. no, mommy, there, there weren't any new students today. Mom says, okay, so what? why are you so... You got cupcakes at recess. And the little girl says, mm -mm. well, you didn't have cupcakes today, mommy. And the mom says, okay, so what is it? What is it? Why are you so happy? You got a sticker on your spelling quiz. Little girl says, we didn't have a spelling quiz. So here, here's a loving exchange between this precious little girl and the most influential person in the universe to her, her mommy. And embedded within the inquiry, right, the dialogue, is a disastrous lesson that the mother has no idea she's teaching and the little girl has no idea she's learning. And you know what it is. Absolutely. That there's no such thing as causeless joy. <laughs> That's we have to wait for some event <clears throat> outside of us to occur 
in order to occupy the high grade states like joy, enthusiasm, serenity, gratitude. Right? We, we, we let, we wait. So one of my favorite mantras is create the state, don't wait. Don't wait for anything. Don't wait for anything to happen. Well, that's why I have this. So this, this uh, sweatshirt is, is, a, is an, an expression of that. <clears throat> so this stands for best damn day of my life. And I mean that. I have a ritual where every morning I wake up and, and I choose to make a declaration. And that's this, that this is, I'm not going to wait to see how today goes. I'm starting it with the decision. This is the best damn day of my life. And I bring that vibe out into it. Mm. And I'm much more creative. I tell you, I've only been doing it for about a year and a half and I ain't quitting. That's awesome. No, it's, it's so good. There's so many things in, in the story that you shared with the little girl. Yeah. Obviously, you know, parents do, we do these things unintentionally, right? Um, I think one of the setting limiting beliefs for our kids happens so easily and it's, it's the parents protective mode. Certainly entrepreneurs that are listening to this know that same mode happens to them, you know, Oh, you shouldn't start a business. That's, that's too risky, right? It's your friends and your family giving, putting their limiting beliefs on, on you based on some sense of security. Mm -hmm. That isn't true. Um, I, Amen. one of the lessons that I learned as a parent was that the language I use, you know, telling my kids, we can't afford that toy oh. rather than saying that toy is not in our budget. Right. And, and explaining to our kids how our finances work and our financial choices work. The toy has nothing to do with poverty or lack of money. The not choosing the toy just doesn't fit the, the circumstances. And, and we fail to educate our kids, A, about the importance of a budget, B, about the importance of our financial choices, and C, that we live in a world of abundance, mm, not mm. lack. Yeah. And all of those things get communicated by making this the quick excuse, right? And that's all it is. It's a quick response to say, I don't want to buy you that toy. Right. <laughs> and, and, and we choose to say something else that programs a completely different result. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I talk about that phrase a lot in my coaching and in my speaking, the whole, I, so I, it's never true. <clears throat> right. I love what you're saying. It's like, you know, it's just an, it's a learned response and it's purely based in scarcity thinking, which is complete nonsense and not, uh, it's not reality. It's just an, it's a low grade interpretation of it. And yeah, and it's a powerful lesson. Yeah. My family, that was a very, very frequently uttered phrase in my family. I can't afford it. And I learned a lot of limiting beliefs about money that I'm still on learning. Me too. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, it, it's the work, right? That's the work is replacing what I've learned. What well, was hammered the, the, home. What was hammered home. The, the phrase I can't afford it is never true. It's never true. It's, it's one of two things, I think. It means... Uh, one, uh, this thing isn't really that important to me and I'm just not saying that, or I think even more frequently or more often, it really translates into, uh, I don't believe that I am resourceful enough to go create the resource for that. Oh, so good. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I told myself a million times, these are two of my former coaches and their names, uh, this is Steve Hardison over here. And this is Steve Chandler over here. And Hardison actually coaches Chandler. I worked with both of them. I told myself for six years that I couldn't afford him. He's very expensive. Hmm. They're both, I mean, these are hot, these are like two of the master coaches of planet Earth. And I told myself for six years, I'd love to work with Steve Harris, but I sure can't afford that. And I said at one time, one time i remember exactly where i was i was driving for some reason i was in downtown central phoenix i was at a corner of thomas and seventh which is just weird but it was and it's not weird at all it's actually it's cool because it's one of those moments in life that etch you know into your memory and i said god i'm never saying that again <laughs> oh and then and then i went and did what it took to, to create the uh, entrance fee <clears throat> nice yeah and it's and so knows. it's so powerful yeah. um and and the sad thing for for me is, you know, my dad planted some of those some of those limiting beliefs, and and they're completely unintentional. 
Yeah. But my dad's personal behavior, he was saving 30%. He was setting setting aside. He retired with more than a million dollars in his 401k. And and, and so he, he was he was doing the right things, but his language was still programming the wrong lessons. <laughs> It's, it's, it's so sneaky. I love that story about the little girl. We're learning limiting beliefs even through a, in the middle of a loving exchange or dialogue. And without the education, right, that we're talking about, without the classes on how to even examine that, like how, how to have like fear be a trigger, like have the emo low grade emotions be an alarm clock, right, to alert us to go, oh, check your thoughts right now. Mm. What, what, are you, are, what are you believing right now that's not true? That's having you feel so poor. That's the practice. So know? much power. Yeah. yeah, we're we're taught to either on one hand bottle up the emotions, right, or 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 hide the emotion, right? Try to change it, right? Anger is bad. You can't experience anger. If you're a man, you can't experience sadness yeah. and cry. Right. right. Um, so you bottle those up and you and you 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 cram them down and ignore them rather than saying. What is this? What is this emotion telling me? And how can I experience it to its fullest? And how mm. can I express it in a healthy way that that serves me, rather than bottle it up and hide it? Because we don't want to put a, and and we end up putting on these facades that that don't allow us to be our authentic self because we're told no one wants to see your authentic mm. self. Yeah, and then and then top that off with even more, which is. Um, <clears throat> I really believe that we spend an enormous amount of time in unnecessary suffering. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Like, yeah, it's one thing that we've learned that we shouldn't accept that we're, we're, that we're inadequate. So I don't want to admit that or express it. Uh, but then on top of that, it's like, well, is it even necessary in the first place? Like so much of our suffering is due to just crappy thinking, like really, really has nothing to do with reality. It's just our low grade interpretations of it. I love sadness. I think sadness is sweet. I don't only ever, I don't only want sadness, of course, but I love the contrast that it brings to joy. So sadness is a beautiful thing. Suffering, not so much. Well, you know? and I think as a culture, we celebrate suffering, right? We, we celebrate, I, I think we celebrate mediocrity. I think we celebrate suffering. And, and there are people who are content in their misery, right? Mm. Their, their misery becomes the 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 thing inside them that they value the most that's and so true. they can't let it go and they can't get out of it because they feel like that's the thing that gets me all the attention so you know um one of my favorite teachers from history his name is alan watts and my favorite phrase or quote of his is each of us is an aperture through which the universe observes itself only the game that we're playing is to not know that <laughs> and then he goes on to talk about the ultimate game of hide and seek. And now this isn't like, like we're not being conspiracists here. We're not like saying that, you know, as humans, we're just this bunch of whack jobs. <clears throat> this is the human experience. We get to free ourselves from the conditioning of our past that would have us unnecessarily settle struggle or worse suffer. But most of us haven't learned the how, mm. like the mechanics of how to free ourselves from the conditioning of our past. That would have me experience reality problematically as opposed to opportunistically and enthusiastically. Mm. And that's so the work. Dark. And that's the work. And the work is fun. The work is exhilarating <clears throat> by paying attention to my moods. You know, the most fundamental practice in mental mastery training is I call it catch on and replace. <laughs> right? Catching myself when I'm feeling unpleasant taking ownership. And again, not that there's any, there's nothing wrong with feeling unpleasant. We just do it way the hell too damn much. Right. We do it when we don't need to be doing it. Well, we ruminate on <clears> it, <throat> right? So it's uh -huh. not only a trigger, it becomes, it becomes our thought life and we ruminate over the past. We ruminate over the things we have no control over. And, and we allow those things to continually repeat the suffering. Let me tell you another story about that guy, Steve Hardison. Uh, he does this cool thing every summer. He does a lot of cool things. And one of the things he does each summer is he picks a town in a neighboring state. He lives also in Arizona. He lives in the next town over called Mesa. So he'll pick a town, right? Like Santa Fe or, or go to Denver or, you know, pick Salt Lake City 
or Tucson, or this summer he picks Santa Monica, California. He'll just pack his car up with a bunch of books and gifts that he's going to give away to people he hasn't met yet. And he's going to go and go co-create miracles with people. <clears throat> so he just gets he just gets a hotel and then responds to life and co-creates magic with people. And he documents it beautifully on Facebook. So it's really fun to watch. You know, he posts pictures, he gets to the hotel, the first thing he does, and he's giving, um, he's having a talk with all the, the bellboys, and he's giving them books and getting their names and then and posting about them and pictures with them, you know, and bringing people's lives up. So he does this for like a week, right? And it's, it's just super fun to watch. Now, this year, he's on his way home. He makes his last post, and he goes, top hat tour. He, that's what he calls each year. He calls it a different thing. It was, he had a top hat this year for fun. <laughs> his top hat tour success and is complete. I'm on my way home now to go see my amazing girlfriend, oh, who happens to be my wife, Amy. I love you. I'll see you soon, sweetheart. The post is over. And like, wow, that was, that was really cool. A few hours later, update. Apparently, Top Hat Tour, not complete. I have a flat tire. I am 150 miles out, and I don't have a spare. So I get to create more miracles. Yes. That's his response. Absolutely. Getting a flat tire in the middle of the desert, 120 degree heat in June. His response is enthusiasm. <clears throat> and he goes, I get to call roadside or port, Porsche. He has a Porsche. That's why he didn't have a spare because it's a tiny little car. <laughs> right? So he's just put it on top. Yeah. yeah. And That's what calls, they would do in Africa. It would be. Uh, right. Spare so he, call, he calls up roadside assistance and he talks to this woman and he's so amped up and she thinks he's on drugs, which he is. He's on dopamine and serotonin, actually, the, right? neurotransmitters that activate all kinds of creative genius. So, you know, he says, well, okay, so, and he's making her day because she's used to her jobs to listen to people who are hating life in the moment. So she's like, you're amazing. <laughs> so are you. He goes, what are we going to do, Mary? He says, well, I'm going to send Marcus out there and he's going to pick you up in your car with a flatbed. He goes, oh my God, Marcus is about to have the ride of his life and he doesn't even know it yet. <laughs> so, that, and sure enough, that's what happens, right? So now I'm telling this story just like I am to you because it's a beautiful story. And it's really, to tell you the truth, it's what I believe we're working towards, which is to, what, what Byron Katie says, responding to all of life with enthusiasm. Mm. She says, until you're able to respond to all of life with enthusiasm, your work is not done. He actually coached her. It's, this guy, Steve, I'm telling you about, coached her. It's very he true. Coaches um, Oprah Winfrey's life coach, Elon Van Zandt. But anyway, so I'm telling the story, and I want to ask him to – I want to make sure I'm telling the story accurately. So I call him up and say, hey, Steve, <clears throat> I actually call him Admiral, and he calls me Boatness. That's a story for another day. <laughs> and I said, Admiral, I'm telling this great story of the flat tire. I want to make sure that I'm telling it accurately. So I have two clarification questions for you. I said, all right, what are they? Clar clarification question number one, how long did it take once you became aware of the fact that you are getting a flat tire in the middle of the 120 degree desert with no spare uh, before you became enthusiastic. And he said, zero seconds, as if I had asked an insulting question. Well, he said, Come on, man. I said, good, good. <clears throat> Second and final clarification question. How are you able to do that? And he said, years and years of practice. And it's practicing specifically what we're talking about right now, which is paying attention to my auto responses to reality and asking myself, do I agree with this? Is this the best? Am I choosing this even? Is this having me be amazing? Is this having me be powerful? Is it having me feel good? Is it having me be constructive or creative? And if it's not, upgrade the hell out of it. So practice, 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 practice. So, you know, scientists say that we complain on average, once every 11 seconds. And that most of those complaints are like 99.9% .9 of them are silently occurring in our minds hmm. and go get, get away, right, without being caught. So my invitation to your audience <clears throat> is to start the practice of really heightening your awareness to the frequency with which you complain. Tiny little complaints, tiny little complaints, what are all the little ones throughout the day? Like, you know, like I play with this thing all the time. I always play with the pens and then like it sna snaps off. I go, oh, man, that's a complaint. <laughs> like, why, why am why? Who cares? <laughs> right. But so my, why is my auto response? Oh, man. So, so pay attention. Get the reps in. So pay attention. 
to the frequency and see how many of those complaints you can catch and rewire your brain, reprogram yourself so that you become your default response is the way it was before you were educated to experience reality problematically and create some expression of gratitude or some enthusiastic response as a replacement and get in thousands and thousands of those repetitions repetitions. So ultimately your automatic default response to reality is at worst curiosity. You come out of the mall and your car is stolen. You go, ah, did not see that coming. <laughs> I wonder what I'll create from this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's so good. And that takes you back to the little girl, right? Because she was experienced causeless joy. Yeah. And I think yeah. I I literally just made a post right before we, we got on and talked about choosing joy, right? This is a time where a lot of people this time of year, you know, can experience great joy, but there are people that experience sorrow. I saw what, that post. I saw what, it on LinkedIn. What if you asked yourself, right? Ask the question allow yourself to experience just five more minutes of joy. And if you can experience just five more minutes of joy, why not more? Well, yeah. Why not? Why not more? Right. Not? And, and I think, you know, scripture, Jesus talks about, you know, be like the little children. And I think that's one of those examples of be like the little children, allow yourself to experience life without all the outside influence. Right. And, and experience joy the way you were created to experience it. <laughs> the coolest class I ever took at any level of education was one that was on death in graduate school. And there was a research study that they did with centenarians. In other words, people that, you know, they're hundred years old at least. So they're on death's doorstep <laughs> and mortality has a fancy way of clearing up our bullshit. So these people have no reason to, you know to lie they don't give a damn so they're just clear and when asked you know what do you what would you do different looking back what would you do different some of the most pop well one of the most popular responses well three of them were uh, i would take more risks i would be way less obsessed with my own success and more interested in my legacy and making a difference but the one you just reminded me of robert is this one which is i would slow down and appreciate how magical and beautiful life is without me having to do anything to it. It doesn't need our help. Doesn't need help, right? 15 billion years that stuff's been unfolded with flawless choreography. I think I think it's got it down. I think God figured it out. <laughs> oh, so good. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by Perfect Publishing, a different approach to publishing a book. Perfect Publishing carefully chooses heroes of hope who exemplify living a life they created through faith, hope, patience, and persistence. No matter what page you open to in this mini cube of hope, you will find a leader with a big heart. You will see you are not alone. The authors may share similar challenges that only hope and action could resolve. Get your free ebook at getadoseofhope.com. Welcome back. Let's get back to more greatness. <clears throat> uh, you mentioned the routine for best day of my life ever. What what other routines help you set your day, set your course? Well, it's all day long. So one of my uh, phrases that I, that I articulate very often is the most uh, mentally tough slash happiest slash successful, because those are all interconnected, those three things. People choose to live in a perpetual state of self-inquiry mm. so and if that sounds exhausting then you're not hearing it properly because it isn't it's actually the opposite of that what's exhausting is spending so much time in unnecessary suffering so it's actually invigorating to always be in inquiries like how am i feeling right now is it good enough could it use a little love you know how's my state in the what here's the language this is language what emotional state am I thinking my way into right now? And do I love it? Is it help? Is it serving me? Could it use a little bump, uh, an upgrade? You know, being in that inquiry constantly, constantly. So that's, I mean, that's a perpetual routine. I love it. That yeah. perpetual curiosity is so good, right? Because that, that helps you discover so much. Just limiting beliefs, emotional state. I mean, yeah, all of man. those things can be discovered by curiosity. 
There is a, um, you reminded me of this earlier, and so it's come up twice now in my mind, so I'm going to share it. Uh, one time, this is, I'll give you a, a quick virtual tour of my office, right? So <laughs> um, that over there is my rocking chair. That's where I sit when I'm doing coaching. And this wonderful, big, cushy chair is where my clients sit, okay, with the ottoman. So there's a woman sitting in that chair one time, and she brought her four-year-old daughter to this. We weren't even working together yet. We were just talking about maybe doing some work together. And it was a little weird that she brought her four-year-old, but I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> and so I just give her some markers and some paper, and she's coloring and stuff and drawing. And, uh, and I'm talking to mom, and I'm, and I'm asking a question that is a, an exercise that I do that illustrates all the, the limiting learned limiting beliefs that we have <clears throat> and scarcity stuff. So I asked the mom the question, what is the most money that you can imagine getting a hold of under any circumstance in a year's time? Mm. So, and I ask it again because I want to make sure that I, I repeat it verbatim. What is the most money that you can imagine getting a hold of under any circumstance in a year's time? So I invite whoever's listening or watching to go ahead and, and answer that question for yourselves and and pay attention to all the gymnastics that you're doing in answering that question. And, and the funny thing is, is most people aren't even answering that question that I asked twice the same exact way they're translating it unconsciously into another question and answering that one, which would be something like, what do you think maybe you could pull off if a whole bunch of things went right? And given your industry and the, what's the potential earnings and all that crap, or even if like, what if, uh, what's the lottery? What if, what's the, what's Powerball at right now? And just think about it as opposed to, that's not the, the question is what's the most that you can imagine getting a hold of under any, a hold of, not earning, right? Getting a hold of <laughs> under any circumstance in a year's time. The little girl, there's actually only one, uh, real accurate response to that question and almost no one no adult ever comes up with it but this little girl did she wasn't even looking up she's coloring on her paper after i asked the question a second time she just goes all of it <laughs> and then she's like no you don't need to hire this guy i'm your coach <laughs> <laughs> right she hasn't she has yet to be educated about scarcity and money miseducated <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Educated, right. Uh, man, so powerful. Yeah, so paying attention, always being in the inquiry. Listening, here's another one, is, is watch your mouth. Because so much of, so our words are a direct reflection of our thoughts. So mm -hmm. they're a dead giveaway. So I don't know if I've done it in our conversation, but I do it all day where I'll say something, I'll start to say something and I'll stop. I said, no, you know, delete that because I'm pra always practicing. I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know, I don't think that that's weak. Delete and replace. Mm. Paying attention to my thoughts and being in the inquiry. Do I even agree with what I just said? Do I really believe that what I said is true? Like, I don't think I can pull that off. Wait, do I even agree with that? You know, and being in the inquiry. Paying attention. Watch as soon as the words are spoken and ask yourself, is that true for me? Do I want it to be? And if no, swipe and replace. So good. Yeah. It's it's like I, the idea that the voice in our head is us, right? Mm. Like, like the voice in our head is even on our side. Mm. <laughs> right. That's so, good. I like that. So, so being lot. able to talk to that voice or tell that voice to shut its hole because it doesn't know what it's talking about. Shut your pie hole, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are not in agreement with what you're what you're trying to put out there. So we, we are going to shut you off. I mentioned earlier that um, when I was talking about Stephen the flat tire, and I call him Admiral, and he calls me boatness, and that's where it comes from, just because I love boats and all. But this is my personal declaration statement, uh, and you don't need to be able to read it. But this is the the product of a decade of work. Nice. And 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 I read these to myself every day. I'm speaking my way. So this is the voice I choose to believe. Mm, amen. And I have this recorded in voice notes so I can listen to it when I'm out and about. Ooh, even and better. I'm, I'm pre-programming my neural. I'm choosing my damn beliefs, okay? Right? I, I, I'm being selected. What? So it's like I am divine grace. And each of these has a long explanation, right? Like I am divine grace and I am an expression of divine grace in human form. I am that this is perfect. I am integrity. I am service. No one can pay me what I'm worth. And it goes on and on. 
I am, in, I am that the how is in the what. I surrender to uncertainty. I respond to all of life with awe, gratitude, and enthusiasm. It goes on and on and on. And that's my truth. <clears throat> that's the voice that I want to have be nice and loud. Absolutely. Preemptively. Well, and <clears throat> none of us are ever taught that the voice in our head is, is still a caveman. Like he's still trying to protect us from getting eaten by a lion when we step out the door. <laughs> Right, right. And until somebody says that voice is only trying to protect you, is trying to keep you exactly where you are because it's comfortable there. Mm. And until you until you challenge that and say, wait, what? That voice wants me watching Netflix and just being content with what I have versus mm. having the opportunity to do so much more and so much better simply because that voice is trying to keep me alive. Mm. And it's old and outdated and it doesn't understand the world we live in. <laughs> That is beautiful. I it love hasn't that. I'm, I'm just up. totally thinking that. Man, that's good. <laughs> so, so yeah, I love. I love. Yeah, it was like it's, it was cool. It served a great, a really valuable function and purpose. It's outdated now, so it's so obsolete. So let's just pay attention to that. That's like we talked about, you know, how um, we practice defending ourselves, right, from when we're being attacked verbally or, or psychologically, right, and we get really mm -hmm. good at that. And it can serve a really good function. Like if we're in an environment, like, you know, if your family's aggressive or your, your parents are aggressive with you or, or anybody, other role model, and you and you learned to defend yourself so that you would so you could be okay. <laughs> survive. Be okay. Survive. And yeah, right. Survive, literally. And, uh, and it, so it worked, right? The defense, practicing defending yourself. But now we've got that skill set. And we take it out into life, into circumstances where it's not useful at all. And somebody could actually give you a compliment or be looking out for you but because you're hearing. Because what you've practiced is defending. You're hearing something differently. You're experiencing it differently as if it's an attack. And then you defend. And it's just unnecessary. Well, and that goes even further because somebody can give you a gift. Mm -hmm. And you can refuse it because you don't think you're worthy. Or you hear you heard the wrong thing and they're saying, oh, you, you need this because you don't have enough yet. And, and this is, this is, you know, putting you down versus it's a gift that's lifting you up and mm. you're accepting it opens up the flow for mm. that's the circulation and, and you're blocking it because you, you're not open to receiving. You know, who you just remind me of, you know, who you just remind me of why, how do we even know each other? Oh, Mr. Berg. Bob Berg. Yes, absolutely. Co-author of the the Go Giver. Yeah, which is, there's only a handful of books on my desk, and it's because they're masterpieces, and this is one of them. Yep. Yeah, well, Bob Berg. Yeah, I have his other one here. <laughs> oh, right on! Shout out to Bob. If you're Shout watching this, Bob. Pop, love absolutely. you, man. Thanks for the intro here. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned you mentioned gratitude as part of that routine of of your I am statements, and so let's dig into gratitude a little bit and how powerful gratitude can be in changing your state gratitude is one of the most you know you just read my mind right there seriously because i was i had just made a note that i wanted to tell you i wanted to share a video with your audience uh that i use constantly in my coaching and speaking and it is entitled it's gratitude but if you google it and i can send you the link if you want yeah, uh, absolutely. if you just google gratitude hd It'll come up and it's a six and a half minute long video that was, uh, it's a film, a short film created by a genius short film creator whose name is Louis Schwartzberg, who I got to meet recently and give a big hug to and tell him how grateful I am for his gratitude video. And it was cool because I walked up to him. He gave a talk at a, uh, an event called Summit in LA that I attended. And after he spoke, I ran up to him and I said, I love you, man. And he, did, he just said right back to me, I love you too. I don't know who the hell I am. I'm like, this, that's good. That's pretty good. So, yeah. So, gratitude. It's a, Please watch it. It's, I, I mean, I, I've watched that film six and a half minutes, probably a thousand times. Wow. And every time I get a little choked up. Hmm. It's so beautiful. And it's narrated by this wonderful man with this amazing voice who's a Benedictine monk. His name is Brother David Steindelrast. Perfect voice for this. 
And, and, and really the message is that we always have access in every moment of our lives to endless gratitude. Mm. I had a podcast myself that just went live 47 minutes ago. <laughs> yep, with a guy named Kellen Flukiger. He's the guest. He died. And then he came back to life. And he had this unbelievable experience that he cannot even talk about without mm. weeping. So he's weeping. I was weeping this morning watching the replay of the interview in the moment when he's talking about when he came back, when they resuscitated him or revived him, whatever, and he said he met God. And he's weeping. And he said it is unspeakable gratitude. That Those are the words that he used to describe that experience. And he's weeping. <laughs> It's so beautiful. So we have access to gratitude in every moment. <clears throat> gratitude releases chemicals. You know, we have an internal pharmacy. Mm, absolutely. You know, I, a lot of, I have a lot. I spent a lot of time working with people who are um, diagnosed with and experiencing depression on varying levels. And I'm of the firm belief that we are highly under activating our internal pharmacy and relying on uh, synthetic pharmaceuticals to control our states. Uh, I would never advise anybody that is taking antidepressants to just stop, but I would advise everyone who experiences any level of depression is to start taking gratitude pills a lot. You can't OD on that, mm, right? And start, and, and start activating, you know, dopamine and serotonin, maybe even some oxytocin. You know, these are the neurotransmitters that are the on switches for joy and intelligence. The on switches for all creative genius, for intelligent centers of the brain. So let's practice being, so, so I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned it. Yeah, I did. Of course I did. Complaining. Get really good at catching yourself complaining. And then the next step is totally replace the complaint with an authentic expression. And that's an important word in there. A, an authentic, not a fake, an authentic expression of gratitude for the thing you were just complaining about. Mm, so good. Right? Like my my refrigerator broke. <clears throat> and steaks are all spoiled and stuff from the freezer. And uh, and I, my instant response is a whole bunch of F-bombs, like carpet bomb. And then I catch myself, right? And then I, as fast as I can, I want to catch myself there. I go, mm, this isn't who I want to be. And this is not how I want to be. So I replaced it with a, a neutralizer mantra, which is called ain't bad, just is. This ain't bad, just is. Shakespeare said that. <laughs> Nothing good or bad happens until you think it's so. That's Ooh. powerful. Nothing good, it just is, until you put a great, sucks. <clears throat> and you do that. So I neutralize the complaint by going, ain't bad, just is. Just is a broken fridge, just is some um, food that needs to be thrown away. That's This is a blue pen. This is just a data. But then I upgraded it from there. So this is the best damn thing. Somebody could go, how? And I'll go, I don't know yet. But I will, I, I will make it be with this attitude. I will get back to me and I will let you know. And even if it's simply a story that I use, like I'm using right now, well, there it is. I'm creating from the spoiled steaks. Well, and I'm going to get a better fridge because <laughs> the one I got right. is working. Yep. So you're in traffic. What a privilege. Wow. Wow. You have a car. Absolutely. Oh. You have a place to go. You have a place to go. <laughs> right. Yep. And how and how wonderful all the people that are involved in creating this vehicle that's mine. Ooh. So that good. gets that gets me places so efficiently. That wow, what a, that I take for granted. Thank you to all the people that 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 worked toilessly on creating these amazing roads that I'm in traffic on. In Arizona, the just think of the how hard that work is. Thank you. Thank you. To the guy that made the air conditioner. Mm -hmm. To Dan Patrick, talking <laughs> sports. <laughs> to radio waves. Woo. And then you just then, then go on with that. Mm. So good. That I have sight. Mm. That I have eyes. That I, that I have senses. Yeah. yeah so watch way. that video. That's, that's Gratitude HD. Absolutely. Louis, Louis Schwartzberg. That's, uh, I mean, choosing, right? Choosing your state, choosing your, your response to whatever circumstance, whatever situation, 
that's choosing the, that's it. choosing your thoughts and and i love that you know you mentioned earlier just doing the reps training yourself to choose your thoughts get a thought that isn't in agreement with where you want to go pff, change it right you, oh, that's a great you have that power and and just like uh olympic great, athletes change sorry. it and get the reps in <laughs> So that yep. so that when it happens next time, you've done so many reps that it's like, oh, I don't even have to think about it now. It just happens. So I uh, that's a true story about the fridge. So it had broken, but I caught it. It broke a week before Whew. and I caught it. So there was nothing spoiled. And I have an extra fridge in the garage. Right. For fancy beers. There you and go. Like, there's extra room in there. And I so I just put everything. So I did nothing. was No big deal. It's just. You could call it an inconvenience, which I don't believe in. That's, I believe that that's a low-grade interpretation of reality. So everything's an opportunity if you have it be. Ooh, nice. so, <clears throat> so that's no big deal. Plus, I have a really good uh, home warranty comp, uh, policy. So they came and fixed it. And I had an amazing time with that repair guy, this huge dude from Poland. I ended up giving him a copy of my book. And we had this brilliant, wonderful conversation talking about how he met his wife. And all this just really fun. It was actually very sweet. And then uh, four days later, that's when, it, and it broke again. And that's when all the food got spoiled. So I was, I was not joking about the whole carpet F-bomb situation. I was deep. I was deep into my complaint. I was being a super victim, mega victim. I was doing it good. And then and it took me about 10 seconds to get to Ain't Bad Just Is. And you know what? I'm pretty psyched about that. Nice. Because that would have taken me 10 days back in the day. Ooh. Yeah, right? been there. So I'm, I'm happy with 10 seconds. I'm not I'm not at zero seconds like Steve Hardison, but I'm still I'm still doing the work. I'll get there. There you go. I like it. Well, just recognizing that, I mean, just like you said in the beginning, that we don't have a class on this. We know we go to the gym to work out our body, but figuring out these things about our mind and making a commitment to working, doing the work, right? I think uh, it might be Edison, it might be Ford. One of those guys said, you know, thinking is one of the easiest things in the world to do, but <laughs> also the hardest. <laughs> right. I think it was Henry Ford. I think it was Henry Ford. And 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 the challenge is we're not taught to think, right? We just think that all that stuff going on up there is out of our control. And 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 taking responsibility, taking one hundred percent ownership mm. for mm. the mm. crap going on between our ears, and then the crap that we let out of our mouth, is is not the cultural way, right? Like we're we're allowed to spout off without responsibility or consequences. And, and the truth is those consequences, regardless of the impact you have on the people around you, when you're spouting all that crud, mm -hmm. just the, the consequences you're creating for yourself is so not worth it, <laughs> right? Like that alone, changing it for yourself is a hundred percent worth the work. Yeah, it is. That's an understatement, right? <laughs> Buddha, Buddha said, uh, your whole life unfolds according to the way that you think. Mm, powerful. Right. So, so, powerful. so let's get into this. So you mentioned ownership. So the most fundamental practice that I referred to a little while ago, catch, own, and replace. So I'm catching myself when I'm feeling uncool. And By Byron Katie says, whenever you're feeling unpleasant, it's simply, it's, it's for one reason. And it's because in that moment, you're believing a thought that's simply not true. Mm. So catch yourself when you're feeling uncool. And then own it. And you just said it. Ownership is huge. Ownership is the get out of jail free card. So <clears throat> ownership, an ownership phrase sounds like this. I'm not feeling frustrated because of what's going on. <clears throat> I'm feeling frustrated because of how I'm thinking about it right now. Oh. And Marcus Aurelius said, you know, the greatest of all Roman emperors, who was a mental coach for sure, said, if you are troubled, it's not because of the thing, but because of your estimate of it, which you have the right to revoke at any time. So ownership. I'm not frustrated because of traffic. I'm frustrated because I'm thinking like a scrub right now. I'm not pissed off because the steaks are spoiled and there's water all over the floor. I'm pissed off because I'm thinking like a rookie. I'm thinking that this is a problem. Simple as that. I am thinking my way into frustration. Nothing, no thing, no one could ever have me be angry, could never have me be upset, could never have me be inferior. That's Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah, without my permission, right? I'm the one. I am creating this state. It's not happening to me. Victims live in the happening to me world. Creators live in the happening for me Ooh. world. Yes, sir. And so problem. good. All right, we've been a little serious now, so we're going to change things up a little bit. 
Right on. You've traveled. You've traveled a little bit. What? Where's your favorite place to travel? Oh my where god. Where do you want to go when they let you go again? Yeah. You know, I've never been to South America, right? I have mm. done a lot of great travels, a lot of great travels, like some of the greatest, like South Africa, Southern Africa, not just the country of South Africa, but all like six countries around Southern Africa. That was amazing. And going to um, visit Nelson Mandela's prison cell wow. on Robben Island, that was what an emotional experience that was. But India, the greatest investment I've ever made, one of the greatest investments I've ever made, one of the top three for sure, was at a place called the Oneness University outside of Chennai, in India. That was that was profound. What an amazing place India is. But but I've never been to South America. Have you? I have. I lived there for 10 years. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. we'll have to talk about that. I think Absolutely. South well, yeah. and I, I have some – I'm creating a business opportunity to do mindset coaching for the, the hot dog cart vendor kind of guys on – in places that's like Colombia so and Africa, and and that's uh, kick ass. I love that. So I, I I hope to when travel opens and opportunities are safe again that that I take groups of eight to ten business partners clients and and we become the table coaches and 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 create a business coaching opportunity for for that's literally the amazing. small restaurant small business that wouldn't get invited to a you know Tony Robbins conference at the Giant Hotel. That's amazing. So, so I yeah, so we're about, going to South America. To you're coming. Where do I learn about that? <laughs> you're coming with me. All right, <laughs> we'll Roger that. Happen. Sweetness, Absolutely. beautiful. The Absolutely. next trip is actually already planned. It's to Jordan. It's to attend an event called A Fest, and the A stands for awesomeness. Nice. And it's a it's a signature event by a company called Mind Valley. And uh, right. I go each year. This one's been postponed, but um, I'm I'm waiting for it to open up and happen again. Jordan. Nice. On the, on the Dead Sea. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Sweet. All right. How important is play and fun? It, play is one of the most responsible things we could ever do. Seriously. Uh, one of the stupidest phrases that has ever been articulated is there's a time for work and a time for play. That is just plain dumb. I agree. And completely inconsistent with human peak performance. Ooh. No one has ever described a peak performance as hard work. Ever. Humans describe peak performances as intrinsically rewarding and light and a lot of times seemingly effortless. Mm. Play is one of the smartest things we could ever do. Love it. Love it. That's uh, that's fantastic. So, so besides golf, what's your favorite way to play? Fishing, deep sea fishing. Oh, I love getting out on the nice. ocean and slaying some sea beasts. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's that's one that's still on my list. <laughs> really? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's so funny because there's like three things that um, if I'm sick and then I go do these things while I'm sick, I forget that I'm sick. Oh, so, so good. It's golfing, deep sea fishing, or speaking and coaching. Oh, yeah. I feel that the way about coaching. I definitely feel that way about scuba diving, so I get mm. it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Love, love scuba diving and – Scuba so diving good. is amazing. I've only gone twice, but both times were very miraculous. It's oh yeah, so it's meditative. a whole new world. So great, a whole new world. Yeah, and it ain't ours. <laughs> we're visitors. <laughs> we don't know much about it for sure. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, what inspires you? Hmm. Wow, what a good question. People inspire me love potential the ability to free ourselves from the conditioning of our past so that we can experience reality as it is in all of its infinite splendor mm. nice so good good you know what people that are super articulate i find that very inspiring <laughs> people who have mastered language it's beautiful I absolutely love and great storytelling that's beautiful all right chris what's your big dream to influence as many people as possible in the time that i have to stop the unnecessary settling struggling and suffering mm. and maybe maybe a viking 
68 foot Viking sport fishing yacht. <laughs> maybe. maybe because I say maybe not because they would cost like three or five million. So what? We'll go get it. Uh, it's because it might be. I like to travel light through life. So maybe it's a better idea to just charter them once in a while. Yeah, I feel that way. My dad bought an RV and thought that that owning the RV was was the, was the great thing, and 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 I think you know, cost wise, <laughs> freedom wise, it actually became more of an anchor than a. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing is I'm not convinced that owning it is the best ch choice. <clears throat> the opportunity to charter one though and have, and you have, have access, you only have to clean it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, and 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 limited use, right? I only need to use it, charter it when I need it, not not have it all the time. That's, uh, that's awesome. So obviously podcasting author, what's been the impact of, of being an author and, and, and having your own podcast? One of the things that I recommend for people to do is, so this over here, this is a sacred corner of my desk. You can see my IMs. I put this here. That actually is not supposed to happen. Nothing is supposed to go on top of this, but it was, I don't know if you could tell earlier, there was a big glare. The sun was shining on my face. Oh, <laughs> but these are my success story folders over here. Okay. So I add to them all the time and it's a smart idea to help us. Uh, it's a tool to help me remember my excellence, which is a very important thing for me and for the people that I serve for me to have no questions about my excellence and my competence. So I get a lot of feedback from my daily dose, which goes out every morning, a little mental toughness tip. In 30 seconds or less or from my blog posts or from the podcast or from the books and it's heartwarming because uh, you know as i mentioned to you before we started recording i don't have kids and i'm not going to have kids so i don't my family won't be my legacy my content will be mm. so when i get messages you know from people saying you you have no idea how perfectly timed this daily dose message was it's like you're writing to me it's like you're in my world i get choked up sure you know because that's it that's the mission to bring lightness of being to the planet and that's evidence that it's working and that's that priceless hmm. so good yeah the value of keeping a folder right even if it's a digital folder on your digital drive and every review or every compliment hmm. or every every encouraging note you get from somebody save that sucker for the day when <laughs> for the day when that one client calls and says you're an asshole right. and you're like yeah. wait no i got the 100 people that said no i'm not yeah this has been growing for years this folder i mean i'll show it again because this is really sacred literally is sacred to me you know yeah it's here. so good you know and it doesn't have to be it's like it just be like the you know hey cd <laughs> happy friday sir thanks for the boost of confidence yesterday i crushed that meeting with the cio and uh, gave me a verbal commitment. Appreciate you, my brother. Nice. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Absolutely. And then there's and one in it. here from the, uh, and then there's one in here from the, the the CFO of Apple who called me a wizard. That's pretty good. That <laughs> yeah, one made it. That's that a good one. It. That that made it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it's and it's not about ego. Okay, so this is this is a, that's a tool. Absolutely. Okay, because the conditioning of our past would have us play small. And the world doesn't need that from us. Well, and and the world the world would have us play small. Yeah. The world would beat you up if you let it. Like the world around us is designed to to crush you like a bug and tell you if you don't buy this thing or you don't have this thing or you need this thing, this shiny object to make you better or make you worthwhile or if you're not in our program, you're you're not worth anything. Mm. If you're not doing mm. this thing right the way we do it, then you're you're no. Yeah, so you we need it. You need you need to be able to have that that encouragement, that pat on the back, that, that, Hey, your thing helped me like that. That's so good. David, uh, David Goggins called it his cookie jar, right? Like he's putting those little notes in his cookie jar and you know, that guy's a beast right. <laughs> in his world. And, and he still had a cookie jar, right? You need that cookie jar to pull that little note out like a, a fortune cookie and read that thing and say, yeah. Oh, there it is. Uh, right. I Absolutely. owe it to the people that I serve to have that folder right there in my line of sight. I love it. That's so yeah. good. I love it. Right next to your I am statements. Right so next to powerful. the sacred, sacred corner, sacred southeast corner of my desk. I love that. I was born that's, in the southeast. I was born in Florida. So that's, that's fantastic. There that's you my, go. That's, that's as close to feng shui as I'm getting. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. You've just had coffee with a, uh, an entrepreneur building their business. 
and you're going to leave them with, with Chris's words of wisdom, what would you share? Heighten your awareness to your moods. Your whole life unfolds according to the way that you think. Right? So pay attention and, and all of your emotions originate from one place and one place only and it's your thinking. Become a thought warrior and everything, every discipline in your life will get easier. Start eliminating complaining, replacing those low grade interpretations of reality with expressions of gratitude or also enthusiasm. The word enthusiasm itself comes from the Greek word entheos, which means the creator within. So good. Choose the high grade states. Chris, thank you so much for your wisdom, for your enthusiasm, and just for the time today. Well, I'll tell you what, Robert, thank you. You are an amazing interviewer. So thank you for this wonderful treat. Thank you for your skill, for your curiosity, and for the gifts that you bring the planet. Thanks for being you, man. This episode is brought to you by intentional decisions that lead to massive success. No, those aren't companies promoting our show. They're qualities that you need to build your business and take control of your life. So to help you out, I'm offering my most popular worksheets, to help you plan the future you want and audit your calendar today. The best way to get what you want is to know what it is and start making sure that your calendar matches. You can download them free today at addvaluemindset.com. If you will take action by just completing these two activities, they will change your life and business. I promise you a new level of results in the coming year. The problem is that we make things so complicated and we lose focus on what is really important. These tools will help you refocus on what matters most. When you align your passion with your purpose in your work, you can be happier and start doing the things you wanted to in the first place, like spending more quality time with the kids. To get your free copy of the tools to start tackling your busy schedule, go to addvaluemindset.com. If you enjoy the show, please like, subscribe, leave a review. But most importantly, if you enjoyed this episode, Share it with someone who needs to hear it. Share. In our next episode, Gary De Rodriguez and Robert share about how entrepreneurship is the biggest lesson in personal growth. Gary really understands the mind and how tapping into your beliefs helps you to see more of what you believe is true. Gary's wisdom will help you to understand your mind and use its full power for your success.